Hey, hey, what's up garden friends? Jeff here, how's everybody doing? Hope you're doing well, I'm great. Hello from my shadow. Today I'm just talking about tropical plant dupes. Well, kind of. This is a video I was supposed to have come out with like two years ago. I promised it to a few people and just, it never happened. My apologies, I've been doing that a lot lately. Just a video talking about plants that help get that tropical look when you don't live someplace tropical. I'm in zone 6A, 6B, I live right on the line. And everything that's in the ground right now in this garden bed, except for there's a croton down there, over there, everything stays in the ground all winter. Not the, that thing, the Washingtonia, that doesn't stay in the ground. Or at least it shouldn't. I we'll guess we'll find out this year. But here's my thing, something I don't think I've ever actually explained on the channel, why I like the tropical plant look. It's not just because I like tropical plants and I love the bold foliage and that lush, vibrant appearance. A big part of it for me is really just having the urge to create a garden that doesn't look the same as everything I see around where I live. So here in St. Louis, it's a lot of boxwoods and spruce balls and just evergreens that are needle evergreens, conifers and those sorts of things. Not a lot of broadleaf evergreens, tons of daylilies, Russian sage, just anything that's local, I kind of try to avoid, which has its pluses and its minus. Has its pluses when it comes to just aesthetics. You can come out to the backyard and feel like I'm somewhere else completely. And I absolutely love that. That's the whole point of all of this. But the minus is that there's a reason that certain plants are staple to where we live, right? A lot of people are growing all those plants I just mentioned because they do well here. So sometimes there's some trial and error. May try something that I, just because it's hardy to zone six and then find out, yeah, doesn't really do well here. And then a lot of these plants aren't even listed as being hardy here, but do them anyways, right? So yes, for me, the outcome there has been tropical looking plants, but maybe you live someplace that's already tropical and that's not your thing. You create your getaway with things that you don't see where you live. Like maybe you have lots of conifers, those sorts of things, because you get sick of seeing the same thing every single place you go. Oh, I've tried to make this list as inclusive as possible. Also, pardon the wind, it is incredibly windy today. And everything that I have on my list is hardy to zone six, but remember not all zones are created equal. So just because I'm in zone six it, here in St. Louis, that doesn't mean it's gonna be the same zone six as say in like Oregon, up where Laura Garden Answer, where they are. It's very dry there, so it's a different climate. I live someplace where it's humid, we get a good amount of rain, it gets piping hot during the summer, but still really sticky outside. And during the winter, it can, it can drop below zero sometimes. So you just, you never know what you're going to get. So a big part of picking out the plants that I use does go into what kind of microclimates I have. I know that I can put things over here in these corners and up against the house that maybe, oh, that aren't quite as hardy, but they're in a good sheltered spot where it stays warmer during the winter. All right, y'all are probably sick of all the rambling. You get it, right? It's just about creating a look that doesn't reflect what you see everywhere where you live. Go ahead and get down to the actual plants. The first one, Sable Miners, Scrub Palms. Great plant for zone six. They have fun fan-shaped leaves. They are a type of palm. They put up really big, pretty inflorescences in the late spring into early summer. Pretty easy to overwinter. When it drops below 10, I still protect mine, even though technically you really don't need to, but they grow slow and it's hard to find them in a big size. It's not something that is sold locally where I live. So getting them was pretty difficult. Took a long time to source them and they're expensive. You get them in a larger size. So I prefer to protect them just to preserve as much of that foliage as I can during the winter time. Oh, and they can take lots of variable conditions. Okay, I don't wanna dive too much into the care on all of these because some of these are going to have their own care videos coming out fairly soon, might even be out by now. But what I was going to say with these is that they are really good for variable conditions. They can go from part shade up to full sun. You can grow them in boggier conditions, like swampy conditions. They can go in drier spots as well, but make sure that they do stay well watered if they are in a drier spot. So I guess that means that maybe they can't go in a drier spot. They can go in a drier spot, but the appearance of the plant is going to be uh, different. I prefer them with a more compact look to them with nice, big, lush leaves on them. When they're in a drier spot, the leaves usually will come out a little bit smaller, uh, held more tightly into the crown and just I don't know, I just don't like the look as much. And if you're in zone six, then a boggy spot may not be a good idea as far as winter survivability goes. So I just, general garden conditions, like well-drained, organically rich soil, they're good with that. Another palm tree, needle palms. Needle palms and those sable miners, the scrub palms I just talked about, both of those grow very slowly and they don't usually form a trunk. The sable miners usually have an underground trunk. 
and uh, sometimes they'll have an above ground trunk. It's not usually too terribly tall. It'll take them a long time to develop it. The needle palms, I guess they do develop a trunk, but it's not like you think of with normal palm trees where you have like a tall monopodial growth on something. It's a big clustering palm, big clustering bush. I already have my lights wrapped in here. <laughs> Just get ready for the colds. You usually have a central growth with lots and lots of little babies that come out. The leaves are more of a shiny green color to them than on those sable miners, which give you that pretty blue depending on which type you're growing. They give me lady palm vibes, but it's not quite there. I think that they're nice looking. It's just an elegant looking plant. Pretty cold hardy, arguably more cold hardy than the sable miners. People go back and forth and that really depends on where you live. I, I treat these just like I do the sable miners, below 10, I protect them because of all the things I mentioned before. They grow like snails, crazy expensive, way more expensive than those sable miners. Down south, I know that these things are dirt cheap. But getting a needle, ugh, ugh, getting a needle palm in this size, if these were to die, would cost several hundred dollars because of how slow they grow. So it's important to me to just to put some lights on them, put a frost cloth over them, and make sure that they don't lose too much foliage and have too much damage during the winter times. There's some damage from last winter. It got really, really cold. We had that polar vortex move through that wasn't as bad here. I think it got down to like minus five for a few days, which is pretty cold but I mean, it's better than how things were in like Texas and a lot of other places. Fun palms, highly recommend. Oh, and you can get them in smaller sizes. They're not several hundred dollars. You can usually get these from a one gallon to a three gallon for under $40. And when you go up from that, the price does tend to climb. They grow pretty slowly. These were planted, I think these were either in five or seven gallon containers, probably like eight to 10 years ago. And they're about four feet tall now. So it's a good amount of growth and they're easy. I don't have to do much with them. Oh, next up. No, not those, sorry. The Akuba japonicas. Have a separate video on these. Love these shrubs. They're a beautiful evergreen, a broadleaf evergreen with foliage that has that gorgeous variegation in them. They're pretty hardy, but even where I live, you have to be careful with them during the winter time. Really solid plant for zone seven and zone six. Just gotta watch out for the winds and you don't want the soil to be too wet during the winter time. So these are similar to those sable miners in the sense and the needle palms where I usually try and shelter these from degrees below 10 degrees Fahrenheit just to preserve that foliage and keep them looking nice for the next year. I've learned over the years that if it's easy to avoid a setback, you may as well do it. If it only takes a few minutes, why would you not, right? So they are hardy here, but I still protect them just to be safe. Oh, next up is one of my favorites, the Hidichiums, specifically the Flaming Torch. There are a few others that have grown, but the Flaming Torch has been the OG in my garden. I've had this since I think 2014. So that's a pretty long time. I would say that's long enough to go ahead and say that this is reliably hardy in zone six with protection. They get cut down to the ground after frost, starts to knock them back some. And then I usually put like two or three bags of mulch on top of the clump which is, comes out to about eight to 12 inches of mulch. That's a lot, but it's really easy to do. It doesn't take long. And the show that they put on, it doesn't look like much right now because they're done flowering. There is one still in flower up here, but that show that they put on is just so magnificent. And uh, they have such vigorous growth to them. I love the way they come up and over everything in the garden. Pardon this lighting, it's just one of those days. They reach out. And I love it. I think it's beautiful. Hummingbirds and pollinators are crazy about these plants. This one, specifically the Flaming Torch, is a variety that grows quickly. So uh, you plant one and then in a few years you'll have some that you can divide up and move around, which I actually did. Did that last year. So there's a clump here, a clump there, another clump over here. All of them survived the winter and we had a bad winter and they were very small clumps. I don't know who keeps putting the pool equipment there. That's not supposed to be there. They only had like two growths on them last year. Uh, just a single rhizome for each one. And then we had those horrible cold snaps, like I mentioned with that polar vortex, and they came back. The spot is warmer over here, but the other spots where I'm planted are fairly exposed, still against the house, but pretty exposed. It gets really blustery and windy here during the winter. So the Flaming Torch is my go-to if I'm recommending a hardy ginger. There are several others. There's the Terra, but it grows very slowly. The uh, Rafilii, that one, pretty nice too. Slim's Orange, I've gotten to come back once. The Polani, I've also gotten to come back. And then I have a, what is it? Is it a Gardnerium? I can't remember. I have another one, but it doesn't flower. I don't think it's worth growing because it just doesn't get enough growth on it during the growing season because it has to recover from the winter so much. Next plant. I know, I'm moving through these quickly, but there's a lot of them. 
Cannas. It's just cannas. I don't know what to say about them. They're just awesome plants. Yeah, you probably should if you're in zone six, dig up those rhizomes and store them. I generally have success cutting them back and throwing mulch on top of them, but they can be unpredictable. And it really surprises me that I have more success overwintering gingers than I do cannas. Cannas are usually good for like three or four years and then we tend to have a winter that kills them back. So this year, the majority of my cannas, I'm digging them up and storing those rhizomes in the house. All right, so I guess earlier when I said everything's hardy to zone six, not fully, not if you have to dig it up and put it in the house. And also the varying levels of protection. <sighs> That's kind of a rant for a different video. Is something really hardy if you have to wrap it up and put lights on it? Now, like I said, the plants I'm doing it with, I probably don't have to, I just prefer to. Another one, I don't have any here with me, but the hardy gardenias. There's the frost proof. That's one, the first one that comes to mind. That's a fairly reliable one. You wanna treat that one like an Akuba from everything I've been told from the people at the nurseries and other growers, where you wanna shelter them from strong winds and wet soils during the winter time. Okay, and then of course, bananas, which are looking horrible right now. It's very windy, so they're just, they're just getting shredded and torn left and right. But there are several varieties that are good in zone six. My favorite is going to be the Baju because it's the most reliably hardy and probably the fastest grower for the size you get out of them. Look at that leaf. Well, that one got snapped. They also tend to have thicker, more sturdy leaves, but we're having wind gusts over the past few days that have been like 40 to 60 miles an hour. That's a big ask to hope for a leaf that large, not get torn up by those kinds of winds. So the Baju, my opinion, the most reliably hardy. There's also the Sycamensis, which is a pretty one. Dwarf Orinocos, those are nice. They stay smaller. They put out fruit. Rajapuri, also maybe potentially an option, but well, we'll talk more about that in a different video. The Velutinas, Musella Laziocarpa, the Musa Saba, Ice Cream, and Namla. There are even more that you can try in zone six, but the only ones I would try where you don't have to do a lot to protect them would be the Baju, the Dwarf Orinoco and the Musel Alasio Carpa. All the others, you really have to step up your protection game. With these, I cut them down to about two feet of pseudo stem and then I mulch the heck out of them. I have always had them come back years where I skipped the mulching and they did okay, but again, it's a sheltered spot. Some people, it seems to be hit or miss with them. I, there are people in zone six who say that theirs just don't come back. I have a different video on hardy bananas that I'm working on. I think we'll talk about the different variables that can go into their winter survivability in that one because there's a lot to it. I think that where you have them sited, when you plant them, what size you plant them at, and the type of soil you have along with how the plants grow during the growing season are all factors that can go into their winter survivability. And that's that's too much for this video. Crinum lilies. There are several varieties that are good in zone six. I love them because they have a nice lush appearance to them. Mine looks like garbage right now because it's late October, November by the time this video comes out and that's just, that's just what they look like in the fall. But they have really long, fun, waxy green foliage on them that can be pretty broad. Different varieties will have different sizes. I mean, look how broad that is. Nice, big, thick leaves. Not like something I see anywhere else around here. And they flower normally really nice, tall, bloom heads on them. This one right here is the Persa Phony. People will always correct me on how I say it. Doesn't matter. You know what I mean? There's also the Sunbonnet. I have a couple of those that just got planted this year, so there's not much to look at with those. And then the Super Ellen, which gets huge. That is a very wide crinum lily. It'll fill up a very big space. And I think the flower heads on that one can go up to like six feet tall. There are more than that. That's just to name a few of them. Shrunking Yuccas. Really all yuccas, just because they're evergreen and they don't just look like a pine tree. It's all about mixing up the evergreen potential in your yard. This is a yucca rostrata. Yes, I'm saying yucca, not yucca. They're different plants. Good in zone six, but I don't leave, I've talked about it before. I don't leave this out because they're just, like with the needle palms, expensive, hard to find in a good size. I just don't want to risk any damage to it. So I take it in. But there are people around here who grow the rostratas outside all year long. They have a fun trunk on them. Fun plants. There should be an update video on the Rostrata out by now or coming out soon. The Recurvifolias are another great option. These have a more of a soft look to them. Their foliage comes out, droops over, and hangs, so it's not quite as like sharp and jagged as you have with the Rostrata. And these are also one for zone seven, but you can do them in zone six if you shelter them properly or have them in the proper spot when you have them outside. All of these take a few years to get going with their trunks, but once they get going, and look at that. That doesn't look like anything else that trunks in zone six, does it? I don't think so. The Rostrata, Recurvifolias, oh, and Alleyfolias, which have a very sharp pointy leaf on them. All excellent plants just to get a totally different look from anything you see around, unless you live in a dry zone six and you see these everywhere. 
Not a lot of people are growing these where I live. Uh, some plants, if you want that Dracaena, ponytail palm kind of look, anything with monopodial growth. Doesn't look like other things you see in zone six. Colocasias. These are the bikini teenies. See them in lots of my videos. They're some of my favorite plants I have out here just because they're so low fuss. They grow so quickly. Great plants. I found these to be the most hardy of any of the colocasias I've tried in zone six, but there's also the pink china. Supposedly hardy in zone six, didn't come back for me. And then the sangria. There are reports about that one being hardy, but didn't come back for me. These, these have always come back. Protected or not protected. They come back every year. They've been fantastic. I will say though, in my front yard, I tried a few clumps of these and they came back for two years. We had a bad winter and they didn't. And that's going to be the north side of the house that probably has something to do with it. Just probably wasn't warm enough for them during the winter time. But over here, south, southwest, sun exposure, they've been good. Ground stays nice and warm for them. Okay, and now I'm breaking down to plants that I don't think I really have any to show, but we can talk about them. The, oh no, I have a wax model or a Northern Bayberry, not the same plant, but similar. Fantastic, reliable evergreen shrubs. When it gets really cold out, sometimes they do brown out and drop some leaves, but I never had mine defoliate all the way. I know where these grow like all over the place down South, at least with the wax myrtles, they're kind of obnoxious, but up here, you don't see them very often. Just looks different. The foliage comes out in this variable pattern here and they're simple and cheap. But yeah, I can see why some people may not consider this tropical, but to me, it's not just about it being tropical, it's about it being something I don't see all over the place. So the Northern Bayberry here in zone six is good. Zone seven, you can go with the wax myrtle. They're essentially the same plant. I mean, not really, but kind of. Oh, magnolias, evergreen magnolias. Those great, big, beautiful, glossy, shiny green leaves with the brown undersides, those magnificent white flowers during the spring and summer. Let's not tell about a magnolia. The Bracken's Brown Beauty is probably the most reliable one to try in zone six. I lost my magnolias last spring or winter. Winter, well, it was spring, but we had a winter event in late April and it just shocked them. They were in pots because it was nice to have that evergreen interest out here during the winter time and get some random snow in late April. And they were like, uh-uh, which is weird. Snow wouldn't usually kill them, but I think it was probably because it had been like in the 70s and 80s and then just plummeted into the 20s and then it was hot again. I think it was just too much for them, but they're excellent plants. Crepe myrtles. I have a love-hate relationship with crepe myrtles. My notches is back here. It's all cut down for the winter time. I'm actually gonna be digging mine and getting rid of it because there's not enough sun here anymore. The trees have gotten too big and it is a pest magnet, but they still are beautiful plants. In zone six, you roll the dice as to whether or not they're going to hold on to their wood during the winter time. Crepe myrtles have really soft wood. So every time it freezes and thaws, the stems in there, those trunks can crack. So it's important the first several years that you have them to go ahead and maybe put a cage around them with some mulch to protect them from those winds. I don't bother with that. I just let them die to the ground because the, the notches will die to the ground and then grow like 10 to 12 feet the next year and still flower. So I just, I don't bother. I do think they look their best though when they have that nice vase shape to them. The Heptacodium, which is the seven sunflower, the Temple of Bloom, it's the seven sunflower. The Temple of Bloom is the one from Proven Winners, but that is kind of a crepe myrtle-ish dupe, sort of. They have really interesting bark. They have fun flowers that the pollinators love and they still have that fun vase shape that you would see on a crepe myrtle. And they're fully hardy in zone six. Whereas with crepe myrtles, you, you don't always know in zone six. Hey, how about some smaller plants? It's gonna be hard to see. Begonia grandis or any of the hardy begonias, there are several varieties that are hardy into zone six. Mine looks bad right now because my puppy took a big bite out of it a couple months ago. So this is just what's left of it. They have gorgeous foliage, especially when it's a nice, healthy looking plant. And they have your typical begonia flowers, pink flowers, usually pink depending on what kind you grow that cascade and dangle down in front of everything. They have a nice exotic look. Be good for that tropical look or fantastic for a woodland type garden or just mix into any garden. They're awesome plants. I have my list in front of me and somehow I didn't list the zingerbers. Zingerber gingers, fantastic. Good into zone six. These just got planted, so they're still looking like they're on the struggle bus, but they'll look absolutely beautiful next year. It's a smaller ginger than those Hedichiums and the flowers are completely different. These will only get about three feet tall, this variety or the two varieties I have here. The flowers come up from the ground, so you don't usually even see them, at least I don't normally see them or notice them, but they have that same tropical look to them. It's just a very lush vibe you get when you have some of these planted. Uh, the Pedicits japonicus or the Butterburrs. Love, love, love these plants. I have a whole separate video on them if you wanna watch that to find out like some in-depth information on them. Big variegated foliage if you get the variegated variety. 
uh, pretty um, wild. They grow all over the place. It's something to plant with intention. You know what you're doing with them, but they have a very big, bold impact wherever you put them. And the variegated variety to me gives me the golden pothos vibes. Like if you've ever been down in the islands or heck, even Florida at this point, you can see where the pothos has taken over. Then you know what I'm talking about, where you just have these big drifts of that big green foliage with the yellow speckling in it. Oh, cacti. I don't really have any, I guess I have some in my driveway, but I think it's surrounded by weeds, so I'm just not gonna show it to you. The various opuntias, fantastic. The cylindro opuntias, they're great too. There are some of the, was it, Kinosaurus, the hedgehog types. A lot of those are good into zone six. It's gotta make sure that soil drains really well. Might need to toss something over them to keep winter precipitation off of them. A lot of the opuntias will lay flat during the winter time when it's really, really cold if you're in zone six but don't be concerned. Usually they'll pop back up in the springtime or know your variety. Cause there are some that just naturally like to kind of crawl and trail. Agaves, this is a parii. There are a few varieties that are good in zone six, but just like with the cactus, should probably put something over them to protect them from any winter precipitation, keep the ground nice and dry for them. But otherwise, pretty sturdy plants. Uh, sedums, I mean, I wouldn't normally think of that as a tropical type plant, but a lot of them have really nice, big, shiny foliage on them. And that's just, that's the vibe big shiny foliage. So you could mix that in, make that work however you want. I can't do sedums, my yard's way too wet. Way, way, way too wet. All these homes up here drain into my yard and so it's like, it's rare that things are bone dry out here. Well, I can do the little sedums, like the tiny little kinds that crawl on the ground, like the lemon coral, which is hardy in zone seven, usually comes back for me. Not very strong. Um, the Atlantis, the variegated one, also really pretty one. None of mine are still growing right now, but various hibiscus. There's the hibiscus Syracuse, which is the Rose of Sharon. They have really pretty hibiscus-y like flowers on them. They come in all different shapes and sizes now, so there's a lot to choose from. Pollinators love them. They do hold their wood all winter, so you get some structure with them, as opposed to like with the mosquitoes, the mosquitoes. <laughs> the mosquitoes, which dies down to the ground, but has much larger, more vibrant, tropically looking flowers on them. And that's a, a hibiscus. What's not tropical about that? They're beautiful in any garden, really. No matter what you plant those up with, they're fantastic plants. Oh, Ponsieris trifoliate. I don't have any of them out here anymore. Trifoliata, sorry, Ponsieris trifoliata. I had a huge one over here. It got too big for the space, needed to be moved. Uh, and then it, it was just, it's a hazard. So. Awesome plants, those are the Japanese bitter oranges. They, it's a citrus, some people argue about that, but looks like a citrus, grows like a citrus, smells like a citrus, and has fruits that taste like a citrus, but maybe it's not. We don't need to go into all of that. The flying dragon variety has really fun contorted growth on it and gigantic needles. I just, it had to go. It was too dangerous because I'm talking huge and it's, it's a big long story. There's some stuff going on last year. So it just, I had to get rid of mine, but it was an awesome plant. I had it for a long time. It was super easy to grow. The flowers smelled amazing during the springtime and the growth on it always looked awesome during the winter because it stayed nice and green and had that contorted look to it. And then in the early winter, they had fruit on them, like fun little bright, tiny oranges that taste terrible. I do have a little baby flying dragon here. This is from Plant Delights. It's called the, it's called the baby, oh, focus, <laughs> hello. It says baby dragon, that's what it's called. So this is why I was okay with getting rid of my other one because I was able to replace it with this, which stays much smaller, I think three to four feet tall. It still has some pretty wicked spines on it, but it's not going to be like my other one that was like eight to 10 feet tall with. Some of those thorns on that plant had to have been like six to seven inches long. They were massive. A scary plant to have around, uh, especially with, you know, stuff. I could go on and on and on, like even as I'm speaking, like there are several ferns that are popping into my head, any evergreen fern. Anything that makes things lush and vibrant and just doesn't look like it belongs where you live because you don't see it all over the place, that's a good option. Oh, bamboo. Well, bamboo's fantastic. You gotta contain it, be responsible with it, but really fun plants. Wow, the weather shifted out of absolutely nowhere. So I'm gonna have to wrap this up because it's getting like misty. Camera's gonna start getting wet. There were a few plants left I want to mention, like camellias. There's the uh, Yuletide Korean Fire April Remembered, or April Showers. There are, uh, there are a fair amount of camellias that are good in zone six. Those are a nice thing to add to the garden just for some extra evergreen interest as far as broadleaf evergreens go. And they have flowers usually in the fall or winter or spring. They have some that flower at different times of year. You want to research which one you get to make sure that the one you have is going to flower when you want it to, but those are awesome plants. 
than the acanthus mollus. That's one of my favorite as far as just perennials go. I don't have any back here. Acanthus mollus, particularly the summer beauty, it's supposed to be more heat tolerant. They have really big, large, glossy, heavily lobed leaves, and they put up gorgeous flowers in the, well, I think, early summertime, early to midsummer, I want to say. And uh, they're a bit of a dupe for like a philodendron bipinadifidum, sort of, if you just want that like big green leaf with lots of lobes in it. That's a good option. One of my favorites. I haven't had great luck growing those. It's been a few years since I've tried though. It used to be that my issue is that there was just too much sun back here, but that's changed. So I think that that's a plant I should give another shot and see how it does. Put it in a spot where we get nice morning sun and shade throughout the afternoon. Every other time I've tried in the past, they just fried when I thought they were gonna have shade and they weren't. Oh, and I left out a yucca. Yucca thompsoniana, probably the most hardy of the trunked yuccas. Looks similar to a ristrata but they don't have the blue on them and uh, they uh, tend to produce more heads. So you get kind of that Joshua tree vibe. Really with the uh, yuccas and the cacti and succulents, those are like could almost have their own video because there are a lot of different types of yuccas and camellias and things for zone six. So I think are worth trying. You may have noticed I didn't talk about plants like windmill palms. I don't, it's, those really depend on where you live. If you can pull them off in zone six, there are people who are growing them in zone six and in zone five. The sable miners and the needle palms, they're generally good to like zero to 10 degrees Fahrenheit. The windmill palms, a lot of people say that they're good to those temperatures. That has never been my experience. Typically with windmill palms, 10 degrees hits, they defoliate. And uh, with the trunk that they have, they uh, are more prone to having a crown rot within those trunks. It's more space exposed. So to really pull off windmill palms successfully long-term in zone six, depending on your zone six and my zone six. Here it's wet-ish during the winter time, which they don't really prefer that. They need to be wrapped. Their whole trunk needs to be wrapped. Their fronds need to be wrapped up. And then like people put entire enclosures around them and wrap those enclosures. Essentially wrapping it up in a winter coat, wrapping a heat cable around it and then building a greenhouse around it. And when you get to that level of protection, that's when I go, is that cold hardy? Yes, it is a very cold hardy palm, but if you have to do all that, then I don't think that that fits this list. I don't want to say go plant a windmill palm and then you find out you have to do all this stuff to take care of it during the winter time, or you potentially should do all those things to take care of it during the winter time if you have an unexpectedly bad winter. Yeah, I don't know. And they're pricey, just like, you know, the sable miners, if you can get them down south, they're not as pricey. Same thing with the needle palms depending on the size that is. Uh, windmill palms are almost always pricey once they reach a certain height. It's, 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 do you want to gamble it? Do you want to take the risk? I don't. I've grown them in the ground at most, I think, was five years. And we had an ice storm and I almost lost my biggest one. I said, that's enough. Dug it up, put it in a pot. I'd rather just scoot it in and out of the house. It's still a great plant to have around as far as cold hardy plants go, because when everything else, you just exploded out of nowhere. As everything else is coming in, all the tropicals are moving in. Those windmill palms and my mule palms and my pindu palms, I have a lot of cold hardy palms that stay out here, usually sometimes into December, January. They're normally in the house for like two months out of the year. So it's still worth having them, but I wouldn't necessarily consider them a perennial. You get it. And the same thing can be said of the sable miners and the needle palms depending on your climate, but that really shouldn't be an issue once they've had a few years to establish themselves. Turbo, baby, you're not supposed to be in there. Get out, good boy. So that's the only reason I didn't mention any of the true trunked palms. There's some controversy behind there once you get into zone six. I'm super excited for everybody who has them in their yard and has had great luck with them. For me, like I said, it's just, it's not worth the risk. I'd rather just move them in and out and not have to worry about them dying should we have a random snap into the negatives and I don't have time to be building greenhouses over things during the winter time. Fall time gets pretty busy around here. There's, there are a lot of plants that need to be moved around and brought into the house. Hey Toby, you such a good boy Toby. All right, that's gonna do it. Hope everybody's doing well. Comment down below, say hi, love talking to everybody and add to the list. What are some of your favorite plants to grow that you shouldn't be growing or different styles of gardens that you're really into? Cause that's essentially what I've been talking about out here. It's not necessarily the tropical plants that I love. I do love them, but I also like, I love alpine gardens. That's something you don't see around here very often. And I would love to have a space. I don't, but I would love to have a space in my yard that was dry enough and sunny enough to have a big bed of gravel with some little conifers and some more of the prairie type flowers. I think that that would be beautiful. I love how that looks. Just about seeing what you can grow that doesn't <laughs> reflect everything 
that everybody else is growing. What do you have? You have been a handful tonight, Turbo. It's a piece of his baby gate. <laughs> Always something. All right, hope everybody's doing well. Having a great day and a great life and everything just going beautifully for you. Ugh, these look terrible. I'm actually looking forward to getting these cut back and brought inside. They've gone from being beautiful to being more of an eyesore. I mean, I still like the way they look, but it's just, you know, didn't plant them so that they could be doing all that. Of course, as always, and most importantly, everybody, keep on growing. Bye-bye.